The whole process of natural selection is to some degree dependent on the idea of variation, that within any population of a species, you have some uh, genetic variation. So for example, you know, let's say I have a bunch of, well, this is the circle species. And you know, one guy is that color, and then I got a bunch more. Maybe some are that color. Oh, that's the same color. That one, and that one, and that one. And for whatever reason, it, some, sometimes there are no environmental factors that will uh, predispose one of these guys to be able to survive and reproduce over the other. But every now and then, there might be some environmental factor. And it makes, maybe, all of a sudden, this guy is more fit to reproduce. And so for whatever reason, this guy is able to reproduce more frequently, and these guys less frequently. And some of them got get killed or whatever or eaten by birds or whatever or they're just not able to reproduce for whatever reason and then maybe these guys are something in between and so over time the the frequency of the different traits you see in this population will change and if they are drastic enough maybe these guys start becoming dominant and start uh, not liking these guys because they're so different or whatever else we could see a lot of different reasons these could turn this could eventually turn into a different species now uh, the obvious question is is what leads to this variation Right? In, a, in a population, sorry, in a population, what leads to this, you know, in fact, even in our population, what leads to one person having, you know, dirty blonde hair, one person having brown hair, one person having black hair, and, you know, we have uh, the, the, the spectrum of skin complexions and, and, and heights is pretty much infinite. What causes that? And then one thing that I kind of point to, and we talked about this a little bit in the DNA video, is this notion of mutations. You know, DNA, we learned, is just a sequence of these bases. So adenine, guanine, let's say I got some thymine going, I have some more adenine, some cytosine. And that these code, if you have enough of these in a row, maybe you have a few hundreds or a few thousands of these, these code for proteins, or they uh, code for things that control other proteins. But maybe you have a, a change in one of them. Maybe this cytosine, for whatever reason, becomes a guanine randomly. Or maybe these get deleted. And that would change the DNA. Now, but you can imagine, I mean, if, if, if I went to someone's computer code and just randomly started changing letters and randomly started uh, inserting letters without really knowing what I'm doing, most of the time, I'm going to break the computer program. Most of the time, the great majority of the time, this is going to go nowhere. Go nowhere. It'll either do nothing. For example, if I go into someone's computer program, and if I just add a couple of spaces or something, that might not change their computer program. But if I start getting rid of semicolons and start changing numbers and all of that, it'll probably make the computer program break. So it'll either do nothing, or it'll actually kill the organisms most of the time. Mutations. Mutation. Sometimes they might make the actual cell kind of go run amok, and we'll do a whole maybe series of videos on cancer, and and that itself obviously would uh, uh, hurt the organism as a as a whole. Although if it occurs after the organism is reproduced, it might not be something that selects against the organism. But anyway, it, and it also wouldn't be passed on. But anyway, I, I won't go too detailed to that. But this, th the whole point is that mutations don't seem to be a satisfying source of variation. They could be. A source or kind of contribute on the margin, but there must be something more profound than mutations that's creating the diversity even within, or maybe I should call it the variation, even within a population. And the answer here is really, it's kind of right in front of us. It, 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 it really addresses kind of one of the most fundamental things about biology. And it's so fundamental that a lot of people never even question why it is the way it is. And that is sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction. And when I mean sexual reproduction, it's this notion that you have, and pretty much if you look at all cells that have, all organisms that have that have nucleuses, and we call those eukaryotes. Maybe I'll do a whole video on eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. But it's the notion that. If you look universally, all the way from plants, not universally, but if you look at cells that have nucleuses, they almost universally have this phenomenon that you have males, you have males, and you have females. In some organisms, uh, an organism can be both a male and a female. But the common idea here is, is that uh, that both that all organisms kind of produce versions of their genetic material that mix with other organisms' version of their genetic material. And if mutations were the only source of variation, then you know, I could just butt off other cells. You know, maybe other cells would just 
but off for me. And then you know, randomly, one sal might be a little bit different and whatever else. But that would, as we already talked about, most of the time, we would have very little change, very little variation. And whatever variation does occur because of any kind of uh, noise being introduced into this, into this kind of a budding process where I just replicate myself identically, most of the times it'll be negative. Most of the times it'll break the organism. Now, when you have sexual reproduction, what happens? Well, you keep mixing and matching every possible combination of DNA in 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 a in a kind of a, 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 a in a species uh, pool of DNA. So let me let me make this a little bit more concrete for you. So let me erase this horrible drawing I just did. So we all have. We all let me stick to humans because that's what we are. We have. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And each of those, in each pair, we have one chromosome from our mother and one chromosome from our father. So let me draw that. So I'll do my father's chromosomes in blue. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I'm running out of space. Uh, let me do more here. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Two, and then I'll throw another one here that looks a little bit different. I'll throw one here that looks like a Y, and we'll talk more about the X's and the Y chromosomes. And then I have 23 chromosomes from my mother, and not to be stereotypical, but maybe I'll do that in a in a more feminine color. Let's see. So I have 23 chromosomes from my mother. One, two. I just have to draw one, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So what's going on here? I have 23 from my mother. I have 23 from my father. 23 from my from my father. Now, each of these chromosomes, and I, and I made them right next to each other, so for example, let me let me zoom in on one pair of these. So let's say we look at chromosome number, you know, I'll just call it this chromosome number three. So let me zoom in on chromosome number three. I have one from my mother right here. And remember, actually maybe I'll do it this way. Remember, a chromosome is just is just a big, if you take the DNA, the DNA it just keeps wrapping around and it actually wraps around all these proteins and it creates the structure but it's it's just a big you just see it like that you're like oh maybe the dna you know no but this has this could have millions of base pairs so you know maybe it looks something like that it's a densely wrapped version of uh, uh, well, it's a it's a long string of dna and when it's normally drawn like this which is not always the way it is and we'll talk more about like that they draw it it's densely packed like that so let's say that's from my mother and that's from my father now these are both, we call them, you know, I'll call them, they're the same, let's call this chromosome 3. They're both chromosome 3. And what the idea is here is that I'm getting different traits from my father and from my mother, for example. And I'm, I'm doing a gross oversimplification here, but this is really to just give you the idea of what's going on. This, this, this chromosome 3, maybe it contains this trait for hair color. And maybe my father, my father had had and I'll use my actual example my father had very straight hair so you know let's say he had someplace on this on this chromosome there is a gene for hair straightness let's say it's a little thing right there and you know remember that gene could be thousands of base pairs but let's say this is hair straightness so my father's version of that gene or the he had the allele for straightness and remember an allele is just a version of a gene allele so I call it the allele straight for straight hair for straight hair. Now, this other chromosome that my mother gave me, this ha this essentially, and there are exceptions, but for the most part, it codes for the same genes. And that's why I put them next to each other. So this will also have the gene for hair straightness or curliness. But my mom does happen to actually have curly hair. So she has the gene right there for curly hair. So she has the, the version of the gene here is, let's see, allele curly. The gene just says, look, this is the gene for whether or not your hair is curly. Each version of the gene is called an allele. Allele curly. 
Now, when I got both of these in my body or in my cells, and these, this is in every cell of my body, every cell of my body except for, and we'll talk a little in, in a few seconds about my germ cells, but every cell other than the ones that I use for reproduction have this complete uh, set of chromosomes in it, which I find amazing. But only certain chromosomes are, for example, this, if th these genes will be completely useless in my fingernails, because all of a sudden the straight and the curly don't matter that much. Or, and, I, and I'm simplifying. Maybe they will on some other dimension. But let's say for our simplicity, they won't matter in certain places. So certain genes are expressed in certain parts of the body, but every, every one of your body cells, and we call those somatic cells, and we'll separate those from the sex cells or the or the um, or the or the um, or the germ cells that we'll talk about later. So this is my body cells. So bodies. So this is the great majority of your cells, and this is opposed to your germ cells. And the germ cells, I'll just write it here, just so you get it clear. And for a male, that's the sperm cells, and for a female, that's the egg cells or the ova. Ova. So, but most of my cells have a complete uh, 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 collection of these. And what I want to give you the idea is, is that for every for every trait, I essentially have two versions: one from my mother and one from my father. Now, these right here are called homologous chromosomes. Homologous. Homologous. What that means is, you know, every time you see this this the the, the prefix. You know, uh, H uh, homologous, or you know, if you see like uh, Homo sapien, or I mean, even the word homosexual or uh, uh, homogeneous, it means same, right? It, it, you see that all of the time. So what they what homologous means that they're almost the same. They 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 are coding. They're coding for the same, for the most part, the same set of genes, but they're not identical. They're not identical. They actually uh, they, they might code for slightly different versions of the same gene. So depending on what versions I get, you know, my what is actually expressed for me. So my genotype. Let me introduce another word. And I'm overwhelming you with words here. So my genotype is exactly what gene, what alleles I have, what versions of the gene. So I got like, you know, the fifth version of the curly allele. There could be multiple versions of the of the curly allele in our in our gene pool. And maybe I got some version of the straight allele. That is my genotype. My phenotype my phenotype is what my hair really looks like. So for example, two people could have different genotypes with the same but they might code for hair that looks pretty much the same, so it might have a very, a very similar phenotype. So one phenotype can be represented by multiple genotypes. So that's just one thing to, to, to think about, and we'll talk a lot about that in the future. But I just want to introduce you that into that there. Now, my whole, I entered this whole discussion because I wanted to talk about variation. So how does variation happen? Well, what's going to happen when I? So first of all. Well, let me put it this way: What's going to happen when I reproduce? And 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 I have I have a son. Well, my son, my contribution to my son is going to be a random collection of half of these genes. I'm going to contribute either one for each homologous pair. I'm either going to contribute the one that I got from my mother or the one that I got from my father, right? So let's say that the 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 sperm cell that uh, went on to to fertilize my wife's egg it just happened to have let's say it happened to have that one that one well i could just pick one from each of these 23 sets and you could say well how many combinations are there well for every set there's two i can pick one of two different uh, i could pick one of the two homologous chromosomes and i'm going to do that 23 times 2 times 2 times 2 so it's 2 to the 23rd. So there's 20 2 to the 23 different versions that I can contribute to my to my to any son or daughter that I might have. And we'll talk about how that happens when we talk about meiosis or mitosis. That when I generate my sperm cells, sperm cells are essentially takes one they 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 you have you have tw instead of having 23 pairs of chromosomes in, in sperm, you only have 23 chromosomes. So for example, I'll take one from each of those, and through the process of meiosis, which we'll go into, I'll generate a bunch of sperm cells. And each sperm cell, each sperm cell will have one from each of these pairs, one version from each of those pairs. So if maybe for chromosome, uh, this chromosome, I get it from my dad. 
I get, you know, from the next chromosome, I get it from my mom. Then I get a couple, then I donate a couple more from, I shouldn't draw them next to each other. I donate a couple more from my mom. Then uh, for the chromosome number five, it comes from my dad, and so on and so forth. But there's two to the 23rd combinations here, because there are 23 pairs that I'm collecting from. Now, my wife's egg is going to have the same situation. There are tw two to the 23 different combinations of DNA that she can contribute just based on which, which of the homologous pairs she will contribute. So if so the, the possible combinations that just one couple can produce, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm using my, my life as an example, uh, but you could use this. This applies to everything. This applies to every uh, species that experiences sexual reproduction. Is that, so if I can give two to, 20, to the 23rd combinations of DNA, and my wife can give two to the 23 combinations of DNA, then we can produce two to the 46th combinations. Now, just to give an idea of how large of a number this is, this is 12,000, roughly 12,000 times the number of human beings on the planet today. So there's a huge amount of variation that even one couple can produce. And, and if you thought that even that isn't enough, it turns out that amongst these homologous pairs, you and we'll talk about when this happens in meiosis, you can actually have DNA recombination. And all that means is, is that when these homologous pairs during meiosis line up near each other, you can have this thing called crossover, where all of this DNA here crosses over and over and touches over here, and all of this DNA crosses over and touches over there. So all of this goes there, and all of this goes there. And what you end up with after the crossover is that one DNA, the one that came from my mom, or that I thought came from my mom, now has a chunk that come, came from my dad. And the chunk that came from my dad now has a chunk that came from my mom. Now let me do it in the right color. It came from my mom like that. And so that even increases the amount of variety even more. So you can almost now, instead of talking about the different chromosomes that you're contributing, where the chromosomes are each of these collections of DNA, you're now talking about, uh, you can almost go to the different combinations at the gene level. And now you can think about an almost infinite form of, vari uh, of, of variation. And you can think about uh, all of the variation that might emerge when you start mixing and matching different versions of the same gene in a population. And you don't just look at one gene. I mean, uh, the reality is, is that genes by themselves very seldom code for a specific, you can very seldom look for one gene and say, oh, that is brown hair. Or look for one gene and say, oh, that's intelligence, or that is uh, how likable someone is. It's usually a whole set of genes interacting in an incredibly complicated way. You know, Hair might be coded for by this whole set of genes on multiple chromosomes. And this might be coded for a whole set of genes on multiple chromosomes. And so then you can start thinking about all of the different combinations. And then all of a sudden, maybe some combination that never existed before all of a sudden emerges, and that's very successful. But I'll leave you to think about, because maybe that combination might be passed on, or it may not be passed on because of this recombination. But we'll, we'll talk more about that in the future. But I wanted to introduce this idea of sexual reproduction to you, because this really is the main source of variation variation within a population. And it re I mean, it me it's, it's kind of a philosophical idea, because we, we almost take the idea of, of having males and females for granted, because it's this, it's this universal idea. But I, I did a little reading on it. It turns out that this actually only emerged about 1.4 billion years ago, that, before, that this is almost a useful trait. Because once you introduce this level of variation, the natural selection can start you can kind of say that when you have this more powerful form of variation than just pure mutations, uh, and, and maybe you might have some primitive form of crossover before, but when, now that you have this sexual reproduction and you have this variation, natural selection can occur in a more efficient way. So that species that were able to reproduce and essentially recombine their DNA and mix and match it in this way were able to produce more variety and were able to essentially be selected for the environment in a more efficient way. So they started to essentially outnumber the ones that couldn't. So it became a kind of a very universal trait. But you know, you could have imagined a world, and there are science fiction books written about this, where you have three genders, where you have you know, uh, gender one, two, three. You could have 10 genders. And it just happens to be that in, in, on Earth, uh, this, this notion of having two genders turned out to be a very efficient and stable way of introducing variation into a population. So hopefully you found that interesting. In the next video, I'll go more into the detail of how exactly meiosis and mitosis works.